everyone. Dr. Jacqueline Burns here with the Invitality Wellness Center, your Wellness Way affiliate in the South Denver metro area, coming to you live this Friday for another Friday quick tip. This time we're gonna do breastfeeding 102. So if you haven't caught my breastfeeding 101, go back and make sure you watch it because that entails all the benefits and wonderfulness of breast milk itself. Today we're getting into the nitty gritty of why isn't this working? This is a question I get asked all the time by moms. It's something that I went through myself. So I really understand this better than anybody else because um, I've been there in the trenches, you guys. So why isn't this working? Um, I think we all have felt this way as moms that you just feel simply out of order, like whatever is supposed to work isn't. So today I wanna kinda uncover the myths of why breastfeeding can be difficult Unlike most people think, even though it is a natural process, it's definitely a learned habit. You know, you really have to work at it with baby. It's not something that necessarily becomes um, easy for you. It, it's, a, it's a relationship and it's a, it's a skill that you really do have to work at. Um, so it doesn't just come naturally for every, every single mom and baby. Um, and it didn't for me as well. So I want to today go over some reasons why it might not be working and why it might be difficult. So this is uh, number one, tongue tie. This is one of the most common reasons why breastfeeding isn't working for a lot of moms. Um, and unfortunately, your pediatrician is not gonna know how to look for this unless they have taken some continuing education or have had some extra training. This is not something that is taught in medical school for pediatricians to look for. Um, our own pediatrician didn't really know what he was looking for and recommended a lactation consultant. Um, which is who we saw. So tongue tie is definitely a really important one. I want all my mamas and dadas and all the families out there to be educated on this because it is important to be able to recognize and to help a family that's struggling to breastfeed to recognize. So uh, this is an issue with the little frenulum. So it's that flap of skin under the tongue that goes down into the jaw and attaches the tongue to the bottom of the jaw. Um, that skin is supposed to be there, but sometimes what happens is it um, grows too much and it grows too tight. So you're supposed to have free movement with that tongue, and a tongue tie is when there's too much frenulum tissue underneath there. So there's four different types. Type one is total tongue involvement. So from the very bottom of the jaw um, all the way up to the tip of the tongue. And that one is very, very easy to spot. Um, you should be able to spot that guy fairly easily as well as um, a lactation consultant or a pediatric chiropractor, somebody like myself. Um, that, that guy is pretty easy to spot. A type two is basically halfway. So from that bottom of the jaw area, about halfway up the tongue. And again, that one's pretty easy um, to spot as well. A type three is a little bit more difficult. It's basically just a quarter of the way, so that last quarter, so from the bottom of the jaw, just up about a fourth of the tongue is a type three. And then type four, which is what our son had, is the hardest to, to spot because you can't see it. So it's what's called a posterior tongue tie, and you literally have to get in there and palpate it and actually visually push down to see that that tissue is too tight down there. Because a posterior tongue tie, it's all at the base of the tongue and it's all at the very, very back, um, which isn't really visible as you can see, um, but it will often get diagnosed as a short tongue, um, which is a misdiagnosis. So short tongue is just like a tongue that doesn't come out as far as it should. Well, there, a lot of times the reason for that is because this frenulum is too tight and it actually needs to be released. Um, so again, this is one that you got to get hands in the mouth with gloves on um, and actually look for it um, because it will definitely cause latching issues. Next one that I want to get into here is lip ties. So with that upper lip, again, there's supposed to be a flap of skin under there but it's not supposed to be too tight and too long. Um, and oftentimes, you guys, babies that have lip ties often have tongue ties. 
So the lip ties are a little easier to spot, and if you spot a lip tie, you can automatically assume there is probably a tongue tie in there as well. Um, so that's another great tip to know. There's also four types of lip ties as well. So class one is very, very minimal, and it's a little harder to spot. So again, it's just kind of the top part of that skin coming down onto the gum line. Um, class two is coming all the way down that gum line. So coming down that full gum line that the baby has. Class three actually wraps a little bit under and goes into the what's called the anterior papilla. So it will wrap around that full gum line of the baby. A class four, which is the tightest and the, the worst kind, um, wraps all the way under and actually goes to the hard palate. So to the top of the mouth. So class four, again, is probably the easiest to spot um, and the most visible. And if you see a lip tie, you want to look for a tongue tie. Um, all of these types of things can, again, also cause a latching issue. So if the mom has um, tender nipples, if she's bruised or bleeding, and I was there, trust me, it is not fun. Um, these are all types of latching issues that often accompany tongue ties and lip ties um, and can create massive problems with breastfeeding right off the get-go. You might actually get a decent latch right after birth um, or maybe a day or two. Sometimes what happens is the skin actually tightens more over time. Um, so over that first week, and that's what happened to me and my son. So they, we saw the lip tie initially, the midwives diagnosed it and my son, um, but they felt like because I was getting a decent latch and his, his weight looked good the first few days, that it wasn't going to be a problem. And then it started to become a problem at the end of the first week and into the second week. Um, so that can often happen as well, where it looks fine in the hospital, looks fine um, the first few days post-birth or like with us at the birthing center looked good, um, got another nice latch, the day's falling, and then it started to become a problem. So don't put this on the back burner, you guys. This needs to be addressed right away so that breastfeeding can continue. Um, so how you address a tongue tie and a lip tie, the best procedure right now is a laser release. Um, you can do um, a cut release, but that is a little bit more traumatic on the baby and it doesn't always work as well. So a full laser release will actually um, fully break up this tissue. It's going to cauterize the tissue, prevent um, any type of bleeding because it cauterizes um, the, the blood vessels in that area, which means it stops the bleeding. And then it actually helps the wound heal up a little faster. It minimizes the risk for infection um, because you're, you're kind of self-containing the wound. Who does that? Um, a pediatric dentist does that. That's who did our sons. Or an ENT that is familiar with kids um, and that type of procedure can do it as well. Um, so those are both two important people to bring into this picture um, if you think you have this. So I really, really encourage you, um, if this is the issue, you've got to get out there, get on top of it. You don't want your supply to drop. And that is that third thing that we were talking about. So sometimes if these are there, now we then have a supply issue, which I had. Or sometimes these things aren't there, but mama feels like she's not getting enough to the baby and there is a supply issue going on. So oftentimes with a supply issue, it could be as simple as getting a good latch, but it's not for these reasons. So that's where somebody like myself, somebody that's a chiropractor that's familiar with adjusting um, infants and kids needs to look at your baby. Um, with the labor and delivery, sometimes jaws get locked up on one side because baby came out kind of funny. Um, upper cervicals can be a reason as well. Um, so what I do is, in any other pediatric chiropractor, it's a very, very gentle adjustment. It does not look like an adult adjustment. A lot of it's a very gentle pushing motion. We're going to get in there and I'm going to work some of that jaw. If there's a jaw thing going on, I'm going to work that neck, maybe do some cranial work as well. Um, and then a lot of times we can get um, that supply issue resolved once the baby's latching nicely on both sides. So a lot of times supply issue can come down to a latching issue. Um, sometimes it's actually not getting that mama's milk up soon enough and fast enough. 
could be because she had a really rough labor and delivery um, and a real traumatic one, especially if there's an emergency C-section involved. That can sometimes cause supply issues at the beginning, especially if they don't get on top of that mom soon enough. Um, so great way to also help with supply is with herbal supplements. So this is a picture of um, goat's rue. Goat's rue is a very, very popular one. It's actually used a ton amongst farmers um, with like cows and sheep. Um, those that have lactating animals where they're doing a lot of milk production. It also works great in people and in our moms. So that's a picture of that one. Um, two other fantastic ones are milk thistle. Um, it's, a, it's a really, really great one. Um, fenugreek as well. Um, both of those are fantastic and very, very popular. Key is keeping it um, liquid and the whole, whole herb. So you really don't want to just do a capsule that's just components of the herb. It's not going to be as effective. So getting the plant, the full plant, in a liquid form that's bioavailable so that you can really get it into your system quickly is going to be really, really important, as well as making sure that it's organic and that it's processed properly. Um, so herbs are a fantastic way. A couple other herbs that are also great, which throughout the pregnancy is red raspberry leaf. Um, that's one that can be made into a tea throughout pregnancy. It's great during, it's great after. Um, fennel is another one that's great for milk supply. Um, that can be taken, another fun one is hops. So uh, there is a lot of midwives out there that will tell uh, moms to have a really hoppy beer after baby is born to help initiate that milk supply. And that is absolutely true. It definitely will help. So key is with the hops, making sure um, that it's a microbrewed beer, because usually the hop content is higher on those, and making sure it's fresh and not pasteurized, because if it's pasteurized, um, it's not going to have as high a content as hops that are bioavailable, because they'll heat stuff up and kill stuff off. So it is safe to have a beer while breastfeeding. Um, you know, it's same rule applies as with, you know, having a beer and driving. Um, so if you don't feel like you can drive, you shouldn't be breastfeeding. And they do have test kits um, available. So if you're concerned with that, you can test your breast milk with a little test strip if you're concerned with that. But basically, you know, one beer every three to four hours, same as you would do with um, going to the bar and having a, a drink and driving. Same rule applies with breastfeeding. You can do both. You just want to watch what you're doing. But hops are actually very, very helpful for getting milk supply going. So that's why a lot of midwives will tell moms, like, have a beer after baby's born um, just to get your supply up and running. It's, it's a great one um, and not as well known. There's a couple other ones. So Shatava Veri, that is a wine that's used in Ayurvedic medicine, so more so um, in, in Eastern cultures, that's one that's used there, um, but it's still available here. Um, and another great one is Blessed Thistle. Um, blessed Thistle and the combo of that and fenugreek is often put together in a lot of mother's milk, you know, supply type of ones, um, but those two together are fantastic for upping supply. The other piece to this besides herbs, is just regular breastfeeding, you guys. So if you don't feel like you're getting a good latch, it's really, really important that every three to four hours of feeding in the beginning is taking place. And if you're not getting a good latch, then try to breastfeed for about five to 10 minutes on each side and then pump the rest of the way. Or if you're already having problems and nipples are getting you know, bruised and bloody, which can happen. You may just want to take a break for a day or two and just exclusively pump. But this means every three to four hours, you guys, 24 hours around the clock, seven days a week. And trust me, I have been there in the trenches with you. It is not fun setting your alarm for two in the morning and getting up and pumping, um, especially when you're already exhausted and tired enough with a newborn but you have to keep up your supply. If your supply is not getting drained on a regular basis, it is not gonna refill. It is a supply and demand kind of chain. And if that feedback isn't taking place, then your body's just gonna stop producing as much. So if you think there is a problem, try to do both. Um, if you're really hurting, just pump. 
and just do a bottle with the baby for a couple days and get into a lactation consultant as soon as possible, you guys. Um, it's really, really important to nip this in the butt because a lot of moms, if this starts to become an issue, will just give up. They won't keep going. Um, and it's so sad, you guys, because consistency is the key to get your supply back up. The other piece of this is using those resources for that mama right away. Do not delay. And your pediatrician, you guys, is not going to know, unfortunately, the best places for all this stuff, depending on their level of expertise um, in terms of more natural options. Some of them know this stuff, but a lot of them don't. Um, so first and foremost, the person you want to get in with um, is an IBCLC. So this is an international board certified lactation consultant. These are often employed by hospitals. Most hospitals have a couple of these on staff. Birthing centers typically employ these or have some that they work with. And even um, certified home midwives or nurse midwives that are delivering doing home births, most of them have one that they like to use. So just ask them. Um, all of these um, can be getting into very, very easily. So for us here in the Denver metro area, there's a fantastic um, group called the Mama Hood. They actually have several of uh, lactation consultants on staff, and they actually have drop-in classes where you can actually drop in and be evaluated, um, I think, five or six days a week. Um, so the other thing is it's very, very easy to just call up the hospital and get into one of these as well on a very short notice. They know that it's a time-sensitive issue, and so they make sure that it is very easy to get in with these practitioners. A lot of them will also do house calls or a separate appointment in a private office. Those are all options, and you just you got to get on it right away. So we ended up doing the momhood with the group um, lactation consultant appointment, and then I actually ended up doing a private one-on-one -on -one appointment as well because our son's tongue tie was so hard to see um, they just were struggling trying to figure out what it was. And I'm pretty educated on it. I am what I would say that pediatric chiropractor. I'm familiar with what these look like, but that posterior tongue tie, you guys, was really tough for me to see. But now I know exactly what to look for. Um, so even for somebody like me, we were kind of sitting there scratching our heads thinking, okay, I think this is the issue. Um, but a pediatric chiropractor like myself that knows what they're looking for, or just a regular chiropractor, again, if they're educated on this stuff and they know what to look for, they can help you. Um, where you're going to go is if you see a tongue tie and or a lip tie, they're going to refer you out to a pediatric dentist or an ENT. And again, you want to look for one um, that is familiar with this stuff, that does it on a regular basis. We have a fantastic one here in the Denver metro area that he does a laser release. He did it on our son. He did a beautiful job. Um, so again, you can even Google, you know, pediatric dentist that does tongue tie, lip tie, laser release. Um, or same thing with an EMT. You probably have one in your area that does it on a regular basis. And if that's what you think is going on, you can even go straight to these professionals that would be the ones to release the issue. Um, other big piece of this is support groups. So La Leche Leagues, nationwide, all over the place. Same thing with Breastfeeding USA. This is another newer organization that has you know meetings all over the place, experienced mamas, veteran mamas that have breastfed or are currently breastfeeding. You can get to these meetings and feel extremely supported, you guys. Unfortunately for a lot of um, us ladies my age, we don't have a lot of moms that breastfed or did it for an extended period of time. Um, and so it's definitely something that it's, it's nice to have a group of veteran mamas that can help you through that process, give you the support that you need um, so that you can have that, you know, just bond. And if you have questions, oftentimes they know these best professionals um, to send you to if you're not familiar with who it might be in your area. The big one that I also want to harp on you guys is the Human Milk Banking Association of North America, you guys. This was fantastic for us. So my supply dropped so much that we had to supplement our son and I was not going to do it with formula. I knew how bad that would be and, and I, it was a last resort for us. So the milk banking associations, they have local um, banks in each state. So all you have to do is get onto this website. You can look at your state. 
you have a local bank in your area that can supply what's called donor breast milk. So this type of breast milk um, has been checked and tested and cleaned um, so that if there are any issues, they don't use it. Um, so you can be confident when you're using the donor breast milk that it's safe for your baby. And you guys, if they're able not to get um, a mama, like for example, with a baby in the NICU, if she can't get her supply going because her birth was too traumatic and her supply just isn't happening, um, this is who all hospitals go to for their donor breast milk that they give to their babies in the NICU. So you can actually buy it yourself through the donor milk breast, um, through the milk banks. Um, that's what we did. So instead of buying formula, we bought donor breast milk in the beginning until I could get my supply back up and back to normal, which was extremely helpful. I felt so good about it, um, and it just took a huge stress off me while I was pumping around the clock to try to get my supply up. So I totally get it, you guys. This is a really tough thing, um, but the donor breast milk is fantastic. You can also talk to other moms in your area that might be part of the La Leche League, um, and you can have other moms supporting you during this time if, if supply has dropped and you're on that you know, edge of stopping breastfeeding. The other thing that I wanna talk about as well, um, besides resources, you guys, is just support in general for our mamas here in the US. So I wanted to put this cover up because we're all familiar with this. So it's a few years old now, but back in 2012, this was the cover of Time Magazine with mama Jamie Grumet breastfeeding her three-year-old son. So it sparked a lot of controversy at the time. Um, a lot of different conversations surrounding extended breastfeeding, attachment parenting, um, just a lot of different things. And I want to bring this up because this is kind of the attitude towards breastfeeding in the U.S., unfortunately. This is what all our moms are up against. We might have a workplace that says that they're supportive and that you can have time to pump um, when you go back to work and you may have family that says, oh yeah, we support you and you can extend to breastfeed and there's no judgment here. But unfortunately, that is not the attitude right now of this stuff in the US. So just in case you don't have a little bit of background on Jamie, um, I think it's important you understand her story and, and why they've made the choices as a family that they have. So she was told that she would not be able to get pregnant, that she was infertile. They started the adoption process of their son that they adopted from Africa and found out that they were pregnant. So this is her biological son, um, had a horrific end to her pregnancy. So she ended up developing HELP syndrome, um, which is life-threatening. They had to do an emergency C-section, get her son out. He was in the NICU. They're trying to get her vitals stabilized um, in the hospital, you guys. And so she was completely out of it. She woke up, you guys, to her husband using the breast pump, trying to get her supply going. And it makes me choke up every time because could you even imagine that type of circumstance? Um, her husband knew how important it was for her to breastfeed. And so he's got a baby in the NICU and he's juggling that and mom and getting, you know, the pump going. The nurses weren't even doing that for them, which I just find crazy. Um, so he got that process going, got her supply up and running because they had chatted about it beforehand. And that was very, very important to them as a family. So this cover was extremely unfair. She didn't know that that was going to be the cover prior to it coming out. Um, and she was not happy with it as well because she didn't feel like it showed a loving extended breastfeeding relationship. So what was done was this is a chiropractic um, affiliated organization, Pathways. Um, they reshot her cover. And this was one that she got to pick out herself, that she felt really portrayed um, that extended breastfeeding beautifully. Um, because she got her supply up and running as well, when they brought their son that they adopted from Africa, she was able to do what's called tandem feeding. So she was able to feed both babies um, at the same time from her breasts and give them both what they needed and start that bond, you guys. That's the most important thing about breastfeeding. You're giving that bond to the baby, that comfort to the baby, um, plus all the nutritional benefits that we talked about last time. 
Um, and it's really something that lasts for life. It gives you tons of confidence as a mom. Um, this is a mom that is extremely self-confident here. And that, you know, that as a family, it's a beautiful photo. And that's what every family should have the option of having. Um, it's, it's a no judgment zone again. And sometimes there are true medical reasons that prevent breastfeeding from happening. But I always tell my moms, every single day you can give that baby, every day of breast milk is a gift because it's such a special bond. It's such a great nutritional component. Um, you know, overall support here in the U.S., this is a beautiful attitude. This is what we should be working towards. Um, there's a report that's called a State of the World's Mother's Report. Um, so it's a couple years old now. The 2015 report, you guys, ranks overall mom, moms in the U.S. 33rd um, out of 179 countries. So there's about 36, just so you know, about 36 developed what we would consider developed industrialized countries. And the U.S. out of all those countries, you guys, ranks 33rd for our mothers and our support overall of our mothers. That is just sad, you guys. For all the money, for all the wonderful organizations we have here in the U.S., um, it shouldn't, you know, we shouldn't be ranking behind countries like Italy and Ireland and, you know, Sweden. You know, we have a lot more money than some of these countries do to pour into our moms here. Another really big scary statistic that I want to talk about as well is how we rank on newborn deaths. Um, so in terms of overall deaths for kids under age five, newborn deaths still account for 44% of those deaths. So I just find that absolutely staggering that here in the U.S. where we think we have this fantastic um, healthcare system, you guys, um, we're, we're losing 44% of these kids under age five still to newborn issues. Um, when breastfeeding itself can solve a lot of these problems. And all it takes is some support for our mamas. Um, so I hope you learned something today. I hope um, in the future some of this stuff changes because it, it really isn't that hard, you guys. Other countries have figured it out. You know, you don't go into a bathroom in Sweden to feed your baby. You just sit down on the park bench and you do it. And I really, really hope that that attitude eventually will change here in the U.S. as well. I think we have a really strong young generation of, of people, myself and younger, that really want to breastfeed and do it for an extended period of time. I personally chose to breastfeed my son until he was two. Um, and I think that however long that mom wants to keep that relationship is beautiful and natural. So we should definitely support that. Um, so I hope you learned something today. I hope that Breastfeeding 102 was informative to you. Um, I look forward to getting some questions for you guys. Um, and this was your Friday quick tip, and we'll see you soon.